So, hello again. Uh, thank you for being with us today. We have uh, our guests, uh, um, Kirsten Murray and Tanasis Ikonomu from Olsen Kundik. Uh, I'll start by uh, briefly introducing the firm and our guests uh, to our audience in uh, our digital platform and also to the students here in the pavilion. Olsen Kundik is a full service design firm providing integrated architecture exhibit design, interior design, urban design, and landscape architecture for clients around the world. The firm's design approach is grounded in the belief that buildings can act as bridges between culture, nature, and people, and that inspiring surroundings can positively affect every aspect of our daily lives. Rooted in the Pacific Northwest, the firm's work museums, cultural and civic centers, mixed-use buildings, residences, commercial and hospitality projects extends worldwide. With a staff over 170, Austin Kundik brings the capacity of a large firm with the intensity of a small practice. The office is founded in 1966 by Jim Austin. Now Austin Kundik is in its sixth decade. Uh, well, here together, uh, we are together with Kirsten Murray and Tennessee's Economy from Austin Clinic. And thank you very much for joining us. Now the stage is yours. Great. Make an introduction. Uh, yes, well, I'm Kirsten Murray, and I'm uh, one of the partners here. And I've been at the firm for almost 30 years now. So I'm going to be uh, speaking a, a little bit about our uh, some of our historical thoughts in our work as it pertains to our topic today. And my uh, colleague, Thanasi, is, is a, a younger uh, member of our staff and has, um, I'll let him tell you a little bit about his background, but we've both been to the Biennale this year mm -hmm. and in previous years, so uh, we were very interested and we've seen the pavilion and we we're very interested in the work you're doing and uh, being part of this conversation, so thank you for the yeah. invitation. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. I, um, just gonna try and share our screen a little bit. Um, is that, will that work better if I just? Uh, can, can you see our screen? Great. Yes. Okay, okay. Perfect. Good. All right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we, we just wanted to uh, present a little bit about uh, a small part of our work and, and try and find uh, themes that relate to, to the Biennale and, and kind of encourage a discussion and a dialogue between what we do, what, what the Biennale does, and some of the, the thoughts around that. Um, we thought it was a it's a really interesting idea what you're doing in the pavilion um like kirsten said we were both uh at, in venice uh, for the vernissage and we're uh, really impressed with this platform for education and and really truly believe that the biennale is all about uh cross-cultural interactions and uh, bringing together uh, the minds to uh uh, not only contemplate um, and have a retrospective, but also start thinking about how different perspectives can start uh, influencing one another. Uh, the, the idea of uh, transformation is something that uh, in our practice has been very important. Start thinking about how one moment transforms to another. And we also thought that it's kind of a nice parallel topic to what happens in the Biennale itself. Uh, we just pulled up this slide just to kind of illustrate the transformative aspects of, 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 of the Biennale itself and the venue and how uh, from one moment to another you have this shift between uh, perspectives that is influenced from the past. So we hope by presenting a little bit about our work we can start thinking a little bit more about the future by having a bit of a contemplation moment. Um, so in the context of our work, um, the, the theme of our, our brief presentation is really about transformation. And this is an image which might explain a little bit about us. This is um, the locks in Seattle. It's a historic picture, as you can see. But 
it, it illustrates the kind of environment that we have here at the locks themselves. Some of you have seen locks and, and rivers, I certainly know. But um, the evidence of transformation that's born out of, out of the necessity to mediate between two elevations of waters and the challenges uh, in transportation that that provides is, is an example of, um, I think, the power of, of transformation in the built environment and the type of thing that in our environment has been very influential to the way we think about work, about our architecture, and about um, innovation and, and opportunity. Uh, Seattle itself, and, and I don't know exactly where everyone listening to this is from or where the students are from, but uh, Seattle is in Washington State in the United States, um, uh, one of the newest countries in the world, and also within our, within our country, the Pacific Northwest and Seattle is one of the, the latest uh, areas to become developed. So I think even 60, 70, 80 years ago, someone coming here would have felt very much like they were in a pioneer town uh, where industry, uh, maritime industry met, mining met, logging, and, and a lot of natural extraction industries. And I think this picture shows, you know, we're also in the context of, of still a very uh, natural uh, ecosystem with, uh, with our city. So that the connection between industry, um, pioneering industry, innovation, and the natural landscape are really central and influential to, to all of our work. Um, again. In a way, the architecture of Seattle has, has historically been an architecture of necessity and, and function. And, and again, transforming uh, things from a, a, a static state to a mobile state, oftentimes around transportation, around things coming from boats, um, things leaving on boats and going to other places. So. So in many ways, it's it's a very hard working um, industrial uh, type of innovation. Um, well, in, in the spirit of a discussion, we just wanted to pose a few questions, which uh, these questions will become more clear as we uh, go through the presentation itself. And the, the three questions we wanted to ask were, one is if we think of mechanical interventions, what are uh, its uh, role in today's modern age? The second question would be, uh, if we were to think about inside and outside, how can one interpret, reinterpret that relationship? And, and the third, uh, in the ritual of transformation, what are the educational and democratic aspects of that uh, transformative moment? Uh, so, so this is this is our office, and um, one of the the key things to our design and our approach is the fact that we we are. Uh, multi and interdisciplinary group of people as was mentioned in our introduction we and, and we work very closely with many consultants and engineers and fabricators who we have worked with for, for decades um, it, and some of them come very directly from uh, the trades of heavy steel of, of boat building of timber fabrication heavy timber fabrication so that's been a very continuous line of craft for us, which very much in, inspires us. So um, in our space, um, transformation is, is very visible. Uh, what you're seeing here is um, our, our central meeting area. The large pivoting door and operable skylight are, are feature elements that we have in our office and throughout our work. And as you can see, they're transforming not only uh, physical elements of, of door and roof, they're really transforming the nature of the space, the nature of the ventilation, the way light moves and the play, the dynamic play between light, um, air, other ephemeral elements, and, and the physical transformation of space that's created by these operable elements is, is, is very much a key to how we think and how we think about buildings and the task that buildings can uh, have to do for their inhabitants. Oh, that's going to be me. Okay, so um, evidenced in, in one of our projects, this is a project designed by Tom Kundig, um, and, and really talks about architecture and nature, I think, very clearly and very diagrammatically. It was one of the first projects where we um, attempted, uh, where, where came up in the design brief to try to move an entire wall 
to transform inside and out and, and connect the building itself to the landscape. And I think that was, that's been a large motivation, the central motivation for our desire to, to transform buildings through kinetic operati. Um, some of the ways we do this, and, it, and I think it links back to our heritage, but it, at the time we're doing a project like that, actually there were many, um, there had been a lot of, certainly there were other ways to do this. You didn't have to illustrate the mechanics and, and play with the physical mechanics. There were electronic, hydraulic, other types of ways to, to operate something like a large, a, a large um, window wall. But, but our, we've had a fascination with actually you know, ancient methods of, of mechanisms. This is an illustration from a very old uh, mechanical text which illustrates the functioning of a governor, which is a, a mechanical element that helps take up slack in a coiled system, something like that that you might similarly see in, in uh, bike gearings. And, and we were interested in utilizing these types of, of really, um, really old technologies in, in a very new technical time to do something somewhat extraordinary to scale of a building. Uh, this, this, was, this is a sketch of, of Tom's, which showed the concept of, of actually utilizing a counterweight, some sort of counterweight. But it was in the, was, it was in the resolution of this with our uh, engineering team that we were really able to, I think, take something from a, a simple concept to something that was you know, elegant in its, in its operation and its execution. Uh, here's a picture of Phil Turner. He's uh, the key member of our team. He's a mechanical engineer, actually, who um, comes from a uh, background in uh, as diverse as automotive design, munitions, <laughs> et cetera, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and works with us to really uh, execute these things in a technical, but also, I think, in a very beautiful way. And here's a mock-up. The, the type of process we might go through when designing an element like this includes full-scale mock-ups, an entire engineering and fabrication team. And at the end of the day, you know, this is a five-year-old girl who's able to lift many tons of a glass and steel window wall. Um, and, you know, the, again, the element of transportation, the transformation, not only are we bridging the inside and the outside with something like this, but doing it in a, in a way that engages and had, uh, the, the human in the operation of it. It educates about um, the dynamic forces of nature and the ability that one has to control and shape those in, in architectural form while they are, in the end, um, really creating a transformation about an interior and exterior space. Um, I just wanted to present a, another theme. I think we're going to go through about five themes of how we use uh, uh, kinetics in our work. Uh, this one, in kind of a similar vein on nature, is more about uh, transformation of a very volumetric uh, uh, expression to a very planar expression. Uh, functionally, it's all about uh, uh, closing an object rather than opening. So how do you uh, isolate uh, a, a house from the elements when you're not using it? And how can you transform it into something that's extremely porous? And, and the duality, I think, in, in, in this project is, uh, I think, is really interesting. And not only is it just the walls, but it's also the roof. Uh, back there in the distance, what you're seeing is uh, a, sh a shower room. I just want to kind of zoom in into that a little bit closer and it just to show uh, the mechanics of it from the front and from the back. And this is a very similar system to what we've been using for our skylight here in the office. And the way it works is like a, a teeter, like a seesaw in which the counterweight is uh, of equal weight as the, as the, as the roof on the front and it's pivoted right in the center so that, uh, all, it, all you need is a very little amount of force to make that moment move. Uh, and, and of course, the kinetics are just a vehicle to get to the, uh, the experience that we seek out. Uh, it's, it's never an end goal. It's always an intermediate. Um, you know, and, and 
those uh, the previous projects have really talked about things at the scale of perhaps a building in the landscape, at least the last two projects. This uh, the idea of transformation uh, is also something that we can uh, explore at the scale of an urban building and at the scale of a city. This is a project called Art Stable. And we, we thought about this as um, a building. It's an infill building in a developing urban neighborhood. And we were really trying to, you know, in our area, we see some very specific, I guess, buildings that are very much of their time. And you wonder sort of what their, their long-term use will be. And, and some of the beauty of, of an urban building that, that, ha, that can live for generations is that it anticipates its own transformation in program and in users. And, and I think an example of that, a great example of that is the traditional loft building, the traditional brick loft building that there are so many of in our um, area. So we tried to think about that in the design of this building and create essentially big open floor plates um, with uh, you know glass that optimized, that, that allowed um, for light and air in various ways and configurations and then build into the facade itself, as you can see here, we call it the, the world's largest hinge, but a system of not only large doors, but uh, a hoist in place so that over the, over the decades, as new users come in and adapt the use of the building from residential to gallery to studio and office, all of which we've seen, um, their continued personalization and modification of the building is, is, is really facilitated by the design of the building itself. Oh, you want to go back for a second? Yes, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so and it, it was actually quite simply done. The, the wheel, the hoist that you see at the left is a is a commodity item uh, installed. Uh, the the doors themselves act very much like doors on a commercial refrigerator with a compression gasket and a hinge that uh, a hinged handle that that allows them to be closed securely in shape. The doors themselves open through a mechanism of of some a simple wheel which operates a threaded rod, which keeps the door itself always in a stable condition in any level of opening. And at the same time, the, the door itself can be open to extend the experience, the spatial experience of the interior of, of the space. So. A little video which illustrates that. And this is actually the alley side of the building which we tend to look at more than the front facade because in some ways it has it has a, a, a more useful meaning to us although we have a similar expression on the front of the building yeah, it's funny how the the back sides of buildings tend to be more interesting than the front sides of buildings a lot of times yeah and in the interior we we adopted a, a similar ethos where the structure itself was always left expressed in any interior partition was treated as um, something that happened on a, a movable track system so that the space itself could be transformed. In this case, this is a, a collection of, a, of an artist, an art collector. And you can see these two systems in unison. Uh, so moving in, zooming in from the scale of a city to something at the scale of a street, this was a really exciting opportunity for us to find ways in which we can uh, take a storefront that's typically very closed off and find ways to engage it with the street and allow those two spaces to blur together. Uh, what we've used here is a guillotine uh, door and there's a counterweight that you see to the left with the rope and pulley system and all operated by a wheel from the inside of the space. Uh, so this is an animation to show uh, the kinetics of it and expressing the ritual of transformation. And uh, it just becomes a very theatrical moment, not just when it's open, but also in the process of opening up to the streets. And there it goes, up it goes, and the gallery opens up to the street. And the counterweight goes in the opposite direction as the door. Those two are of equal weight to balance each other out. And then even at the scale of, of something that happens within a building, I think in a more modest furniture-like scale, we think the aspect of transforming space um, lends itself particularly well to social environments such as workplaces where uh, people can be allowed to transform their space 
for functional purposes to to adapt it to what they're doing at a particular time and allow the the nature of the space and the tasks there to be evolving throughout the day and and as even as the course of business changes over years uh, this is a technology workspace and a, a simple integration this happened in an existing building and, and a simple installation of an operable uh, counter and table system which can transform a space from a kitchen space to a meeting space to a quiet study quiet work and, and allows you know, everybody that approaches it as an element to transform the space themselves has been uh, the, the key area of exploration for us. Oh yeah, and then, and then just another idea about transformation as it relates to program and community and outreach. This was a, a experimental storefront that we did actually in our building in a vacant retail space. And we started to really think about the concept of um, you know, something that had traditionally been a store, a retail space. And, and in our city, the, the concept of retail is really changing. So how could you take a retail space and turn it into a cultural space, a storefront in a way where, where nothing is sold, but ideas are shared and explored. This is one of our installations. We did um, rotating installations for almost three years in this space. Uh, this was an example of, of how we did this. We usually came up with a very uh, temporal architectural language. In this case, formwork um, salvaged from a job site. You can see us installing and reinstalling this because we did it backwards. Um, <laughs> then created, uh, the, turned into to actual enclosed space with something as simple as shrink wrap, then uh, used to build a, a temporary greenhouse in the space where we uh, grew mushrooms and invited the community in to sort of watch this process and have uh, meeting and dialogue and food and, and, and enjoyment around around this sort of as a pop-up type of use. Um, and just continuing the theme of uh, more intimate and more intimate explorations, this is one of uh, at the scale of a material and, and testing out what uh, what is the effect of a change in state of material that can influence the community and, and the street and how that can start engaging different demograph demographics. Uh, this was an installation that we did uh, last year and it was one that uh, was in a very public space that was accessible by a, a range of social groups and ages was there uh, throughout the lifespan of, of the ice. So it was there for as long as the ice lasted. It was lit, it was, um, uh, it was, you were able to touch it, you were able to feel it, and you were able to kind of put your imprints on it. And it was really fascinating how uh, people were really intrigued with, with, with the idea that they could revisit it every day and it, and it, and it felt different. Um, so, so with that, we just want to kind of end with this slide and and just kind of put all of the themes that we've talked about on one on one page, from uh, explorations from nature, city, street, social outreach, and materials, and and have some thoughts on what what people's impressions are between the past, the future, and and um, the, the the spaces in between. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for this inspiring uh, conversation and uh, the works you've been uh, showing us. They're really amazing. And I guess uh, it really fits with this, uh, this week's uh, workshop because we were concentrating on Carlos Carpa and uh, of course uh, by doing that we were uh, visiting the artisans uh, who uh, work with scarpa um, in various projects so maybe our uh, participants would like to engage uh, to this conversation and maybe they have a couple of questions for you can you use yours well hello um first of all we just saw your bu buildings and they are just really amazing and I love 
uh, your designing concept, really just transformation uh, is, I think, a really important point for the future. But also, um, I just thought if uh, you have any concerns about your buildings for the environmental and social sustainability, exactly. So is there any concern about your buildings? Well, you know, well, you know, can you talk? Okay, great. Thank you. I think we're always concerned about the impacts of our buildings on the environment. I mean, and, and, and what we're doing, I think if you look across the different types of buildings, we get the opportunity to design, you know, you, you will see some of the buildings as small buildings in the landscape experiment. And, and I think, Think that that's how we look at those projects as a grounds for physical experimentation of something at a small scale i shall see with some of those residences and you know we they're usually fairly passive buildings you know in our in our landscape they certainly do i think um take on the role of being prototypes in a way and then when we're able to take that uh, experimentation and incorporate it into larger ground up buildings or buildings that are many much of our work um, is adaptive structure elements and buildings like you might see in our office. Um, we see those as revitalizing and re-engaging existing infrastructures. So that's something I think that we're we're more and more interested in, and we're more and more able to do. I, I think initially it took a private client of some means to maybe um, support an exploration like that, but now we're able to do these in very ordinary commercial spaces and, and again when it makes sense when opening up to the environment and a mild climate is is a useful type of thing but also you know in the interior of, of buildings where it really allows you to get more use out of less space so we're we're, we're very we're, we're trying to be very thoughtful about that and really look at the opportunity of transformation as something that increases uh, physical sustainability but also promotes the cultural sustainable culturally sustainable ideas. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, thank you. And I have also another question. Uh, just like designing environmental buildings, what is the greatest challenge for you just designing environmental sustainability buildings? What is the, the, greatest, the greatest challenge? <laughs> Sure. Uh, there sure. Are many, there uh, are many. Yeah, there are many challenges. I I think it's a, it's about finding the 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 minimal intervention required to to create a sustainable building. Uh, I think we're always kind of inspired by finding low technology ways of uh, of, of maintaining sustainable approaches to design. Um, and I would say one other thing too, I think one of the big challenges is, is I think in, in modern times, especially in the United States, the thinking of architecture is something that's a disposable element. And we, we think the biggest, and I think that's a, a challenge, making the initial investment in a building, the intentional design process and, and making decisions about a building that are intended to help it last for hundreds of years instead of decades is, is something that's very hard for us to do in, in modern time. And so we do, try to think about that a lot and try to get our clients to think about buildings that way, building things smaller, uh, but, but more flexibly and, and, and a better quality um, with more intention. So, so that, and, and again, that's, that's quite a challenge, I think, for all of us as designers these days. And I think education is also important. Um, we have to educate our clients to make them believe that opening a window is a good thing versus pumping it with air conditioning, for example. Uh, and just things like that, I think it's a responsibility on us to educate as well as uh, apply practices into architecture. Um, <clears throat> yeah. uh, I think you're uh, screen sharing, uh, so we see uh, ourselves in the screen. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Let me... Yes. Let me let me let me try let me try and yeah. there we go 
Um, yeah, thank you for a great presentation. Um, uh, your work is outstanding and it's really interesting. Um, yeah, and I, I'm really impressed by kind of this exploration of or this of transport uh, transformation or states of transformation and this idea that it's not just a physical thing but also atmospheric. But um, the one thing uh, that you perhaps didn't talk about, and I perhaps like you to talk more about is kind of the notion of human action because it's quite clear that in your work the engagements of your projects are very kinetic and you constantly talking about this interaction between man and architecture uh, so perhaps could you comment on that yes i certainly and i think i mean we that is illustrated i think in, in some of our images but i think we you have to think about it with everything you do and it can be it can be as simple as imagining you know light and views in a space and how you know, by creating a view, creating an opportunity to see inside and outside, even if it's as passive as a window, um, you're you're setting up an opportunity for a user to have an experience. And so I think our, our, we try to be very articulate about that aspect in, in the planning and overall formal design of the buildings. And that, but it, then I think the next the next scale, and, and probably within the narrow focus of our discussion, we didn't talk too much about it, but that level of craft and material, like the, the place at which your hand begins to touch a handle or even you know, a wooden surface, we're, we're really trying to engage with natural materials that don't have a lot of finishes, that don't have a lot of treatments, but that exist um, in, their, in their most natural state, especially if there's an existing, if you're working with an existing architectural space like you're in right now, you know, that, that preservation, that, um, juxtaposition between that existing aged material and that new intervention is typically pretty important in our work. Um, the scale of um, the, the space with a person's scale and proportion is a very interesting um, aspect of, of that connection between the user and their space and, and doing things even at the scale of larger buildings that happen at the scale of an individual like the ability to open something um, the, the ability to to measure your own physical scale against an architectural element in, in a way that's um, illustrative of scale. Those are those are some yeah. of the things that we add into our design thinking. Yeah, I, I think we, we have a kinetic that the skylight that we were showing you at the beginning, uh, we're always feel a sense of accomplishment of being able to open something with our with our hand. Um, and, and it's really impressive that I can just shift a little a lever physically witness the transformation of that skylight to being open and 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 the movement of the hand is making a transformation at the scale of of the whole space it's a very very la large gesture but at the same time because all of the components are expressed the 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 link between um physics and yourself are much stronger when you press a button, and of course that's like the, the easiest way to do it is just put a button on the wall. A lot of that ritual is just lost. You, you don't you don't feel emotionally invested in that uh, in in that process. You've kind of relinquished that to uh, some weird electronic device that's hidden, and you don't know what's happening behind there. interested in your uh, I was really interested in your uh, like kind of self-operating machine like objects like as if it's the pulley system like an automaton approach uh, a bit of nostalgia of the, like mechanics maybe and uh, you were talking about the low technology as a sustainability uh, design strategy and uh, as as we've been uh, Going for like uh, Zanon, for example, the, the metal workshop yesterday, Scarpa's uh, the most critical uh, workshop, uh, metal designer that uh, for uh, probably 60 years. And uh, while we were talking about it with the owner, uh, he was talking about uh, this craftsmanship. We're not going to be uh, in any case in, in today's modern age as you were. Uh, as it was your first question, where you were saying like mechan mechanic, if the mechanical interventions in today's 
a modern age is possible. And uh, he was uh, talking about his own sustainability in the workshop as uh, having this kind of the uh, workshop from uh, different schools all around the world as an exhibition. So I was really wondering, and since you're uh, trying to pull this kind of like nostalgia of me mechanics in your design strategy, uh, do you think uh, could it be a different kind of uh, mode of production in this like uh, sustainable approach? Yeah, well, I think I think we're trying to avoid nostalgia. Well, we're we're really interested in in the logic behind it, and and it's about um, almost designing a tool in that it's it's built for for functionality. Uh, so if we take the logic of the of the kinetics themselves, uh, that's what we're trying to apply into sustainable systems. In other words. Um, in, in a large scale building, for example, I think a lot of the kinetics don't make as much sense, but we try and use the same kind of uh, logic that we developed in designing these smaller homes and applying it into something that's more static. For example, if it's about shading a building, normally you would have these um, like screens that will come up and down and we do all these like crazy things or, or pump it with some sort of, uh, Put start thinking about the the mechanical VRF systems, but if you start looking at the logic in which we developed our past projects, you'd start maybe taking a moment to pause and think about what can we do that can be uh, really simple and elemental and have a big impact. Um, thanks for the inspiring talk and projects. Um, I was wondering, with um, your projects with such a level of um, mechanical complexity, um, like for each of those projects you've shown, are they mostly led by engineers or architects, or do you have like external consultants with like all those um, physics, like? Um, yeah, phys physical um, complexity or, yeah, do they start with, does the concept start with those, for example, like joints and stuff? Well, it, it, that's, an it, that's an interesting question. Do we turn off the sound? Great. Uh, you know, it started, it's, it's like most things that are really interesting. It started a bit accidentally, I think, the, the kinetic part of our portfolio and it, it started, um, uh, with, you know, a client wanting to, uh, you know, have a, a clear story window open that you couldn't reach and there was a motor that was specified and the motor was too loud and it didn't work. And then we called, we called Phil Turner, who was an exhibit designer and, and we knew rather a, a, a just a, a smart thinker about those kinds of things. And he helped us resolve this technical problem, which introduced us to him. And then, and he had his own company. And then that led to the, the chicken point project where the whole window wall opened. And that began, I think, that really illustrated to us a way of thinking where we could come up with an intention. And by we, I think, you know, largely Tom Kundig was the, the person who, the architect in our office who really initiated this thing that, that is so prevalent across our projects now. But it was developing a relationship with an engineer that was, uh, brought to the table very early it's like here we'd like to move this this way we'd like to slide this this way this is the the architecture that we're dealing with and our intention and how we'd like it to work and understanding enough fundamentals ourselves about how things work but then um get he would be able to come to the table with just a knowledge of well you could do that with a gear you could do that with a rod or what if we drove it this way and he would start to model with very simple simple models and tools and and then begin to we would take that i think kind of through the design and continue to uh, deal with how that kinetic element interfaces with the architecture and the structure what it looks like how big or small things are visually and proportionally while the engineering team was kind of refining the the technical movement engineering aspects of it now it started as a relationship i think the first few were really partnerships between our two firms but as the work has gone um 
Phil then, Phil is actually retired and he now works for us uh, part time, but we still work with his company to fabricate things, but we're doing things all over the world and working with a wider variety of people now than we ever have. So sometimes these, the, the partnerships that we have with, um, with different builders that are doing it, contractors are able to do it themselves with some of our technical and engineering guidance. Sometimes, um, you know, metal workers are the ones who really come to the table with that engineering partnership. Sometimes it's window fabricators. So it's, we're trying to democratize it to the extent that it's not something that can just be done in one little, you know, studio uh, in Seattle, but that we can find, you know, some, some, some partner in the local craft economy of any place that, that we can work with to do these things. And I think some of the simplicity versus complexity and something like a large pivoting door is really quite simple. Any of you could draw it any, you know, most builders could build it. You can specify the hardware, think about the proportions and weights. Any engineer could help you do that to, to some of the things that are, I think, more um, esoteric in their functioning. So we, we take all that to, into consideration when we design how simple who, what skills there are there, costs, what's appropriate to the project and where it is. Thanks. Um, it's, uh, it's actually very interesting because we've been visiting um, Carlos Scarpa's workshops and we learned how he kind of um, always go to the craftsmen and talk to them and stay with them all the time. So this, this collaboration between like engineers, craftsmen, and architects is, have been very interested in, to us as well. And if it, hopefully it's, it, it, hopefully it's, it's all of you. Uh, Scarpa is an incredibly influential architect for all of us in our office. I think we're all basically Scarpa junkies that got together in <laughs> Seattle and started doing architecture. It's very, so we go there, the pilgrimage uh, often, and, and we work with many craftsmen window uh, fabricators and things in that area because there is this such a rich tradition of craft there um, in Venice and you know I think in Scarpa's work I think he illustrates everything that we hope to do you know the articulation have how a piece of wood touches a piece of metal touches the ancient piece of stone that it's mounted in it, you know there's everything there that you'd ever almost everything that you'd ever want to think about as a designer so that that's very um, continues to be very influential to us so yeah, just we're jealous that you're yeah. there doing that. <laughs> and, and just the celebration of all those moments. And somebody mentioned complexity and some of these mechanical devices. And I should just, you know, for the record, maybe point out that we're usually aiming towards the simplest way of getting to our final destination. And some of those appear more complex because you we have a rule. Some of those have a rule where you're not using electricity. So it just lends itself to a very different beast. So thank you very much for this uh, very inspiring uh, and intriguing presentation and talk. And thank you for your answers uh, to our questions. That's been very helpful for us and uh, hope to see or meet you uh, again. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you. Likewise. Take care and All have right. a nice day. All right. Well